Okay, um, sound is working, I guess. Uh, thanks, uh, Walter, and thank you all for coming. Um, I know that at CCC, uh, quarter to one is, uh, you know, what in a normal working schedule would be like eight o'clock in the morning. So seeing you all around here is like really great, and um, I feel quite um, surprised actually to be in this room. Um, this talk is about certificate authorities and how HTTPS authentication is uh, well broken and how regulators trying, are trying to fix it. And well, I had actually expected to be in a sort of a classroom or workshop room downstairs and actually asking you questions. So my initial talk was about you know, asking questions. OK, so how do you think about this? And how does the community think about that? But in this room, that's, uh, that's quite uh, challenging. And, you know, apart from that, uh, I feel quite honored to, to be here. I mean, uh, sharing the stage with uh, people that travel 250,000 miles a year to uh, defend internet freedom. Um, people speaking out against quite powerful forces. Uh, talk yesterday was quite, uh, yeah, I was quite impressed by that. Um, and then talking about certificate authorities after that, it's a bit like, um, you know, in Dutch we say um, beer after wine, if you know what I mean. Anyway, um, the talk yesterday, um, my sheets aren't showing. I don't know why that is. Maybe I should try and fix that. It's an other screen, maybe. Look, there we are. <laughs> um, no. Angel, come and help me. Ja, hij staat in het scherm hier rechts. Zal ik anders gewoon voor je doorklikken? Of, uh, nee, ja, hij moet er gewoon komen. Anyway. So yesterday uh, there was this talk about the Patriot Act and uh, ways in which, uh, ways in which um, governments uh, all around the world can uh, access your data. We recently did a study on that, uh, cloud computing uh, and the Patriot Act in higher research institutions. And um, it was quite a funny story, um, you know, I mean, not a funny story in terms of how easy it is to, um, to access uh, data for U.S. authorities, especially of non-Americans like most of the people here in this room, non-Americans not living in the United States. Um, we looked at um, FISA, so the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and yesterday one of the speakers mentioned that that is currently under consideration in uh, the U.S. Congress. Um, and I, I don't want to go all too far into that, but uh, when we released this study, it's just a little, uh, just a little anecdote. Uh, at these conferences, people come dropping, dropping in, so I thought the first couple of minutes talking about this a bit. When we released this, this was on a Saturday, uh, it was covered in the national uh, Dutch uh, uh, 8 o'clock news, because it's quite uh, something how easy it is. The day after, so that's on a Sunday, we get an email from uh, the Netherlands Embassy in Washington, D.C. Uh, them having been contacted by the Department of Justice saying that, well, 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 the study of the Dutch researchers in Amsterdam, uh, you shouldn't take it too seriously, and it's not. So that only shows you over the weekend, so 8 o'clock in the Netherlands, and the next morning on a Sunday, uh, it shows you how effective uh, some government institutions are and um, how big an issue it, this is. So this is really one to watch. It got some coverage on CBS News and, uh, well, we'll be following the, the U.S. debates on the FISA Amendments Act very closely. But that's not what today is about. Today is about our paper called Certificate Authority Collapse. And bear with me, this is work in progress. So I know many of you probably know much more about the technical details of HTTPS authentication than me. Uh, we got an opportunity to present this at uh, Harvard University and are currently updating uh, the paper. Um, and just to see some hands, who has read the paper? 
That's nobody. Oh, that's one, one, that's a very good thing because I will give you sort of an update of the paper and of enhance to the, <laughs> to the person that actually read it. It's on SSRN and you can see the abstract there and I'll give you the link uh, later. So for the presentation, I will first, you know, very shortly point out what HTTPS authentication, uh, what the model is behind it. And then we'll tell you something about uh, the DigiNotar hack. DigiNotar, a Dutch certificate authority that got hacked. It was a landmark breach and the mitigation was very insightful and illegitimate, uh, uh, but illeg illegitimate. And it's a pretty damn good story. So I, I, I wanted to share that with you today. And it really points out what these uh, more systemic, more sort of fundamental vulnerabilities of HTTPS authentication are. So that's what I'm going to talk about next. And then in June 2012, so that's a couple of months ago, the European Commission launched this quite uh, expansive regulatory effort to regulate this uh, unregulated SSL environment. So the main question of the presentation is, well, um, will the EU succeed? And um, that actually points out to, will it legitimately actually address the problem? Um, and finally, I will sort of have more, present more broader findings about, uh, if you want to go about regulating HTTPS, what, uh, what to do. So my main messages um, are, and this is the thing you have to remember after the after lecture and the rest is more sort of entertainment, I guess, is that HTTPS authentication is fundamentally broken and somebody needs to fix it because HTTPS is a really important thing on the web. You all know that. But that someone that needs to fix it is not the legislature. It is you, actually. And there was a very, very good talk yesterday um, in uh, Zaal 4. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Um, the e-signatures proposal will do more harm than good. And when you want to regulate HTTPS as a regulator, you should be humble on technology and focus on uh, apprising all the values and not only the economy. Uh, think about the role of all stakeholders and not only certificate authorities. And um, uh, the role of the law actually is to optimize economic and bureaucratic incentives and not sort of determining that is the technology or that is the model that uh, should be used. The internet's much better at that. Okay, starting with the HTTPS authentication. We probably all know what HTTPS is, right? It's this a S after HTTP, it sort of establishes secure connection. Um, you can actually see it, it's the padlock in the browser. Um, HTTPS, it comes this log. And maybe if you're looking at the sheet, you'll be wondering why the Fresh Prince of Bel Air is, <laughs> is my next step. That was actually because I was looking for a good handshake. A handshake is, uh, is, is, is the way we talk about these things. It's when uh, an end user or his or her browser and a website establish this connection of trust and afterwards they, uh, they encrypt their communications. So I'm not going to talk about the encryption itself, although there's very interesting things about to, say, to say about that. I'm going to talk about the handshake. The model is more or less uh, uh, in a simplified version. This is a graph from the paper. It's, uh, it's an end user that uh, through his web browser establishes a connection with a website. That's the, the white arrow that goes to the left. And then from the website, there is this, hey, cool, you want to connect. I have an SSL certificate. That gets sent to the browser. The browser then checks whether the SSL certificate um, is signed by a trusted certificate authority. And uh, um, that can, for example, be because one of the certificate authorities involved, I'll come back to this later, is part of the chain of trust. Right, so these are more or less the four stakeholders involved and when the certificate is trusted, the web browser turns back to the website and the end user and says, okay, you two can connect in a secure way, now we're going to encrypt the stuff. And this is, all, this is what it all should be about, right? So preventing that somebody in this connection between the end user and the website intercepts the connection and performs a man-in-the-middle attack, either intercepting or, or altering the information that is transmitted between the two. Um, just very shortly, this security of HTTPS authentication is extremely crucial for the internet. 
uh, it has evolved into the de facto standard for secure browsing. Um, according to a McKinsey report, uh, it has uh, sort of facilitated uh, the spectacular growth of an $8 trillion e-commerce market. I mean, it's a lot. Uh, let's agree on that. Um, and it is, of course, vital for the relative confidential communications of end users. Um, I say relative because, you know, everything, of course, can be hacked, but, you know, you have a Quite, quite a strong degree of, of protection. And this is the case for governments, it's the case for businesses, and for consumers. So this actually concerns everyone that, that uh, is on the web. Um, it's also quite crucial for submitting software patches or for sort of automatically updating software for machine-to-machine -machine communications, etc., etc., etc. It's, it's, it's everywhere. So now let's turn to uh, the day or the moment it all went wrong. Um, and that was when uh, Iran took over the Dutch Certificate Authority, uh, DigiNotar. We still actually don't know who, who has done it. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that later. So DigiNotar was a root certificate authority. They run some pretty essential uh, f um, internet facilities in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, DigiD, which is the e-government sort of uh, um, a citizen identification tool, but I'm primarily, of course, talking today about the SSL certificates. But it run them both, and what happened is that all these services at DigiNotar were sort of separated by a virtual Chinese wall, but all interconnected through a Microsoft Exchange server. So there was one server to rule them all. Basic, basic, basic mistake, okay? And then this one server was secured with a username and a password combination that wasn't that hard to guess, right? So prod admin, product administrator, was the password and the username, and it was quite easy uh, to come in. On top of that, and this has only recently been released, uh, the DigiNotor website was the way uh, uh, to sort of enter the servers, and DigiNotar hadn't performed 30 vital software updates. They had just ignored that for a couple of years, actually. So things were really bad at DigiNotar. So what happened? This enabled uh, the, uh, the hacker or cyber criminal or whoever uh, was involved in this, the nation state, we still don't know, uh, to sign well, quite a lot of false certificates. Uh, 26 for Google.com, 22 Skype.com, 14 for the Tor project. Uh, and what I always find very interesting is, of course, 25 for CIA.gov, uh, add-ons.mozilla.org, update.microsoft.com. So, I mean, this was one very easy hack, uh, not, not that advanced. And, you know, you can already sort of guess what the damage is, right? So if, you're enable, if you are able, as a hacker, to sign all these certificates, you can actually sort of, uh, you have the first step into hacking the communications of, well, basically quite a lot of people. Um, in the DigiNotar uh, attack, uh, the targets um, um, were uh, about 600, 50,000, I don't know if you can see this, you can't. Uh, 650,000 um, uh, unique IP addresses. You never know how many people that are. I mean, many people can be behind one computer or many uh, computers can have various e uh, IP addresses. And most of these IP addresses originated in Iran, 95% of them, and 5% were uh, VPN uh, services, uh, proxy services, and um, Tor, actually. But these numbers from the very recently released forensic uh, new uh, sort of forensic report uh, are quite unreliable. It is all based on OCSP logging. And we all know that CS OCSP logging is very contentious, or we don't all know that, but it is. Um, OCSP is not supported by all browsers and clients, and it's very easily to fake, actually. So, um, it, I mean, in a, hypothet a hypothetical uh, scenario, um, the attackers only wanted us to think that all these 
uh, in, uh, communications were intercepted. Maybe it was a lot less. Maybe it was much, much, much more. But uh, we only focused on Iran to sort of divert the attention from the actual attacker. We, we, we just don't know. And this is actually one very sentence um, in, the, in the new forensic report that sort of establishes uh, that. Uh, and um, you can find the link uh, when the sheets come online and you can uh, read it all. It's about 100 pages. It's extremely cool. It's, it's an extremely cool read. So clearly, something is rotten in the state of the internet, right? And how are we going to fix this? This is sort of the, the, big, the big question. Well, the Dutch government just said the day after this came out, stop using the internet. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, always a solution, right? <laughs> stop using the internet. This is uh, minister, uh, the Minister for Internal Affairs uh, uh, saying on the front page of the leading Dutch newspaper, just don't do it. Use letters and bank checks, just like me. Right? Luckily, the weather was good on that day. As you can see, it was uh, September, beautiful weather, but um, um, this was uh, uh, when this sort of came about. Um, uh, this minister uh, um, announced a, a press, uh, press conference, press conference, Saturday night at one o'clock at night. So the nation was thinking, OK, have we gone at war with the Belgians? Or uh, has, the, has the government fallen? Or what is wrong? No, no, no. At the press conference, uh, the minister said, the internet is broken, but I have uh, taken measures, and now you can get back to sleep. <laughs> OK. Um, a couple of days after, he says, stop using the interwebs. So, you know, you have to understand who this man is. <laughs> this is Minister Donner, the man who saved uh, the interwebs in the Netherlands. Anyway, the mitigation measures taken uh, on a more general level, uh, taking one step um, back, is that the government actually overtook Diginotar. So, from uh, one moment uh, uh, to the other, uh, there was this crisis meeting, very high level, several ministers involved, and they said, we have to take over this company. Um, still, it isn't clear on what basis the government acted. I've been talking to a lot of people, and they say to me that the government was acting on a private law basis. Right? So the, company, uh, uh, the government was acting like, like me or a company, and just having a negotiation with Diginotar and saying, Diginotar, in a free, sort of free will, uh, without any sort of public uh, force or use of, uh, of sort of the government monopoly of, of uh, enforcement, freely saying, OK, you can have the company. Normally, when a government does something like that, it needs a public law basis. It needs a legitimate basis because it is forcing uh, all sorts of, uh, 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 well, it is enforcing um, um, interests that are public. So while these public interests, of course, can be very legitimate and uh, very important that we have a government in several sort of these alarming circumstances that can do a, a thing like that, we don't want our government to get out there and say, you know, we acted on a private law basis. Somebody should uh, launch a freedom of information request to those contracts. Anyway, the other side of the equation was that when the government overtook DigiNotar, trust revocation of its root certificate was delayed in the Dutch market for many important, uh, uh, I wanted to say many important browsers had already revocated trust and released software patches, but Microsoft didn't. And this is quite essential. So the patch to remove DigiNotar from the Microsoft uh, trusted root certificate list was delayed for a couple of weeks while the Dutch government had overtook DigiNotar, a CA. Something, something, something's wrong there. But the mitigation was labeled as a success story in bureaucratic circles. The government had understood the internet and had uh, leaded accordingly uh, in, this, in this big crisis. 
And that is still sort of the tenure of today. Okay, uh, I want to make very clear that Diginota was a big sort of, it was a very, very big thing. A lot of government machines and a lot of sort of machine-to-machine uh, uh, -machine communications in hospitals and in very critical environments were actually sort of uh, dominated by Diginota certificates. So perhaps there were very, very good reasons to, um, to sort of delay uh, or, or at least sort of alarm uh, uh, sound the alarm bells on these Diginota certificates and on very rapidly mitigating to, uh, or migrating to other certificates. But still, there lacked, um, this mitigation lacked a legitimate basis. And this is something that we have the rule of law for, uh, to uh, sort of regulate these circumstances and ex exercises of executive power. I'll come back to that later. And one other very interesting question is, what was the role of Microsoft in all this? Why did Microsoft delay it? And what was the wheeling and dealing that was going on between the Dutch government and Microsoft at the time? Very interesting. So, even broader view. The policy responses 18 months after. Uh, this is a lot of information, but I want to focus on, on three dates. So, on 6 and then on 19 June in 2011, the incident was detected by DigiNotar. On 2-3 September, so that's three months later, uh, the Dutch government takes over the Ginotar after it had heard one or two days before that, um, that uh, this breach had been uh, happening. So there's three months between that. And then, until August 2012, the Dutch government in e-government transactions still allowed DigiNotar certificates. So that's 11 months after these certificates have been breached. And that's 14 months after, um, after, uh, uh, after the initial hack was happening. So that was not exactly a success story now, was it? Here's the evidence. Um, the IRS, so the taxation uh, services of the Dutch government, are on, uh, what is the date there? It's 23 July, um, are still warning tax advisors that are submitting individual and uh, corporate tax applications to the e-government uh, application, are warning on this date, July 2012, to uh, migrate to other certificates. But, as we can read a little bit below, the resolution is not good enough, until August, these certificates were still allowed. So that's one year after, 11 months after it took over. I mean, what could have happened in these 11 months? So, rounding up, I mean, uh, this part, HTTPS is widely used, it's high risk. It's a global socio-technical system. Um, a wide range of incidents. I, I was only telling about DigiNotar, but we have seen hacks at Komodo, at VeriSign, uh, TrustWave was doing some bad things. Um, I mean, this is all over this HTTPS authentication system, which is an essential facility. The world really depends on it. Breaches have serious damages, uh, both financial and non-financial. After the DigiNotar hack, it was sort of speculated, we still don't know, that uh, Iranian activists uh, may have lost uh, their life because of their Gmail um, uh, communications having been intercepted. We still don't know. And one point that I really want to make is that unjustified trust really increases damages. So if you have a sort of perceived uh, trust in your communication, you think that it is encrypted, you think that HTTPS is working, but it actually isn't, then the damages are, can be much worse because you actually disclose much more information. And there's no regulatory framework at all in place. That's going to change, and we'll talk about that a bit later. So, Taking a bit broader perspective, so what are these systemic security vulnerabilities? So I'm not really talking about incidental, really bad hiccups at DigiNote or, you know, ignoring 30 software updates, but at the systemic sort of structural security, security vulnerabilities that underlie um, this uh, HTTPS authentication model. Well, there are many, 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 many. 
and these have been known for a very long time in the security community. And actually at last year's uh, CCC and at the 2010 CCC, uh, Peter Eckersley of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, amongst others, um, has been presenting on this and starting a really cool project that I will talk about uh, in a bit. And in our paper, this is extensively described in, well, in 20 pages actually. So um, um, if you want to have a go, please do. I will just name a few. Remember, this was the, uh, how the data flows in HTTPS authentication. You have these four stakeholders and interactions. So the, the one big thing that everybody agrees upon, more or less, is that uh, the one big systemic vulnerability is that any CA, so any certificate authority, can vouch for any domain name, which means, of course, that any certificate authority can be a single point of failure for the entire system. Now, this was perfectly demonstrated that at DigiNotar. When DigiNotar got breached, uh, a hacker was, a, or a cyber criminal, or how you want to call it, was able to uh, issue more than 500 fraudulent certificates. And the entire system uh, could not be trusted any longer. Now, who are these certificate authorities? Here, here we come to this EFF SSL Observatory project. It's more than 650 certificate authorities in the world, spread over more than 50 jurisdictions, and very interesting, over 50 are owned by governments. I mean, this is uh, not only the Dutch government, not only the US government, it's the Chinese government, the Yemeni government. I mean, all sorts of governments actually perform this crucial role in the mediation of HTTPS. And how sure is that? I mean, that's, uh, that's, well, that's something open for debate, I guess. There's, I just wanted to name this because it's such a cool project. A really new... Uh, um, a uh, project at UC uh, University of Berkeley, uh, which does a bit uh, a similar thing um, as the EFL, uh, EFF Observatory, SSL Observatory, but it actually established the connections between these CAs. The website is below. And yes, I've checked this morning, DigiNotar is still up and running. Um, it is an intermediate uh, certificate authority uh, under the root of Entrust. So DigiNotar has been breached. As a root CA, it has been revoked, but it is still up and running. And it is quite logical because there's still machine-to-machine -machine communication somewhere in the world running on DigiNotar certificates. And uh, revocation would mean that it wouldn't run. But you know, it has, uh, it has suffered such severe uh, security uh, flaws and, uh, and a breach, and it is still up and running. Why is this? That's because, uh, or another problem, is that um, certificate authorities that have root status are trusted by default by browsers. So you can, uh, with a b big bag of money, as a certificate authority, you go to an audit company and you say, you can audit me. It's only a paper trail. It's not a forensic trail. Then you get uh, a signature. And with that signature, you go to a browser and you say, hey, I got the signature. Give me root status. And that's basically how it, uh, how it goes. So the obligatory cartoon here uh, sort of uh, tells you that that model, of course, doesn't have forward security. I mean, at some point in time, say X, a uh, certificate authority is trusted because it has performed this audit, but you know, X plus T, whatever T stands for in time, um, just as with DigiNotar, it could be, uh, well, well be the case that the trust in the certificate authority could not longer be warranted. But trust by default means that if you buy a certificate authority at that browser, uh, or, or that certificate authority, then um, the browser trusts your certificate by default. I'll come back to this later. Now what happens in this HTTPS authentication market is that not every certificate authority wants to you know, have the bag of money and do the audit and do everything. So what happens, and you can see this very well in the, in the UC Berkeley graph, these red dots are root certificates. And all the other green dots are intermediate uh, certificate authorities that hang below them. If you have a contract as an intermediate certificate authority with only one 
root certificate authority, that means that you uh, uh, become part of the chain of trust, and that means that while you have pretty lousy uh, security requirements, you're not audited, a browser hasn't ever said to you, okay, I trust you, it means that you can sell certificates. So this has, you know, created a quite exploded uh, certificate mar uh, market out there. I mean, many of you will have tried to buy a certificate ones to uh, get HTTPS on their website. And, um, you know, if you can buy it a bit cheaper at an intermediate CA, you never know what the security practices at those companies are. You just have to trust them on their blue eyes, I guess. Um, then your uh, certificate will be trusted. What the message here is, is that it's a completely intransparent market and we just don't know uh, how many intermediate certificates there are and how they are actually sort of interconnected and well, given the fact that it's such an essential system, that's, that's, that's a problem. And then there's of course the attribution problem, which is in a legal sense a, a big, big problem. So. You probably all know this, but in the real world, the penal law, for example, it was all based on actor and intent. So who has done a certain criminal or a certain act and what were his or her intentions? On the internet, that's pretty, pretty impossible. That's what's called the attribution problem online. All our sort of criminal law still is very much based on this uh, fact that, or on this idea that you can know who has done it for what motives. On, online, that's not, prob uh, that's not possible. So we have to sort of rethink the way the law approaches uh, these sort of questions. I'll come back to that later. And then, as was demonstrated in DigiNotar, by the way, attribution problem, we still really don't know who the hacker was with DigiNotar one and a half year later. So this is also this, um, um, something that the DigiNotar uh, breach showed. Okay, then information asymmetries. DigiNotar got hacked three months after it found out about the hack, it uh, notified uh, the, the CERT in the Netherlands. So for three months, this sort of massive spying of communications was, uh, was abound, and nobody knew about this. It is a certificate authority that knows about it, but the damage is actually uh, suffered by uh, end users. So there's not really an interest uh, for DigiNotar to disclose this information. That's why you have as information asymmetries. And then if you look at browsers, they have a really, really daunting task in this all. I mean, they have to make the very, very, very difficult trade-off between connectivity and security. Now, the end user only wants connectivity. I mean, we've all been at websites where we have got this security warning, and we've all sort of clicked on, and we just wanted to go to the website. We just wanted to see the hamster dance, right? I mean, it's Friday night, you're tired, you want to see a dancing hamster, as uh, Jonathan Zittrain always says. So we're just clicking. But the browser actually has a responsible role to, to weigh the interest of connectivity of the end user uh, with, uh, with uh, his or her security. A second problem is that it depends on uh, trust revocation or certificate revocation and on quick responses by CAs. So it's not only the browser that is, uh, uh, that is responsible for, for this. And then a very, very sort of extra um, complicating factor is that scale is really important here. I mean, we've seen that Komodo has been hacked a couple of times, but Komodo purportedly has about a quarter of the HTTPS market. So if you revoke the trust in Komodo, a quarter of the HTTPS internet becomes inaccessible if you do that as a browser. So scale is a true risk factor here. The bigger uh, CA is, the harder it is to revoke trust. Now, if we look at websites, they implement HTTPS really poorly. SSL Pulse is a project, and I checked yesterday about today's data, and it's about 15%, not 14.2. But at the website level, the most popular websites were surveyed, and only 14 or 15% of them implement HTTPS um, in, in the most sort of state-of-the-art uh, uh, faction. So websites actually initiate this, this sort of trust model, 
by buying certificates and by offering HTTPS, but only 14.2 or 15% of them implement uh, HTTPS um, in, a, in, a, in the state-of-the-art way. So websites are also a part of the problem. And then the end user, I mean, go figure. This is the website of CCC. Um, if you go to CCC website, um, my browser tells me that the security certificate of the CCC event website cannot be trusted. So what do I do? I want to know what the FAR plan is, right? I'm just clicking, clicking, clicking. So what is the responsibility of the end user in this? I mean, can we really rely on, that's also what you hear, that's what you hear a lot if, for example, industry lobbying, they say, yes, end users always uh, or also have a responsibility in this, uh, in this story, right? But, you know, I mean, I'm browsing and we're everywhere and any place in the internet. Technical problems are really hard to understand for the average end user. What are you going to do? So, what sort of a main message is, is that every stakeholder in this HTTPS authentication model is part of the problem. I mean, at every stakeholder there are sort of challenges that should be met. That's a very important thing. But, and now we come to the EU proposal, is every stakeholder part of the solution? ENISA performed a pretty good um, uh, analysis, uh, quick analysis of the Diginota breach, but there was one sentence in this analysis that really stuck in the head of the European Commission, apparently, and that is, you know, amidst a financial crisis, the ENISA used the words that certificate authorities might become too big to fail, just like banks. So this is where we come to the EU e-signatures regulation. And the question whether um, it will succeed uh, in regulating HTTPS. As I was saying, in uh, June 2012, the European Commission uh, launched uh, a proposal, the e-signatures regulation. Now, uh, a regulation is different than the most uh, uh, discussed, also at this conference, um, uh, uh, legislative proposals, which are EU directives. Not the data protection regulation, but for example the data retention directive or the law enforcement directive. What is so uh, particular about a regulation is that once it gets adopted at the EU level, it has direct binding force in 27 member states. So that means that, you know, Brussels, uh, it's for most people, it's not really on their radar. But this time around, instead of with a directive where you have the implementation on a national level and a new discussion, like with data retention, this is once it is um, um, negotiated by this ordinary legislative procedure, which is a sort of a ping pong uh, process between the EU Council, member states, ministers and the EU Parliament. Once it gets adopted, it has direct binding force. And what is interesting to note is that there will be probably, we are sort of witnessing a paradigm shift. This was previously an unregulated environment, which had come up from the Netscape browser in the 1990s, SSL, um, and is sort of uh, thoroughly discussed in IETF, Fora, and uh, well, those places. Now the EU takes over, and it will be quite heavily regulated after adoption, at least if the proposal makes it in its current form. I won't discuss all the contents with you. I mean, it is discussed in paragraph four of the paper. Um, uh, but I want to focus today, and it sort of connects to uh, my previous story, on scope and on liability. Um, furthermore, it got provisions on security requirements and on security breach notification and on how to supervise this, but it would be too much to uh, go into all of that. But I want to talk to you about scope. So the EU proposal covers trust service providers, that's a definition, established in the EU. Of course, the EU cannot sort of regulate companies that are uh, 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 established outside of its borders. It can merely sort of engage in bilateral uh, agreements. But this is about trust service providers established in, in, the, in the EU. And for the first time, this will include certificate authorities issuing these unregulated, previously unregulated SSL certificates, DigiNotar, for example. 
And all the other critical stakeholders, which we just talked about, like the browsers or the websites, will remain unregulated. Okay, this is a policy choice that is made, but it has been exceptionally poorly motivated. I mean, it's only in one or two sentences. Why don't you include websites, for example? Why don't you include browsers? Well, the explanatory memo hints at the requirements for websites, but then it immediately says, well, that is a responsibility of the HTTPS market. Okay, you might think that. But why does the EU think that? Because not all EU organizations are securing their websites. That's the only argument that is given. So we're not going to fix the HTTPS problem because we ourselves haven't fixed it yet. I mean, it, it was quite uh, something when I found that. Um, anyway, um, the real consequence here is that it places a disproportionate burden on uh, a subset of the HTTPS value chain. Um, so only certificate authorities are, uh, are regulated. I will, and this is sort of, this is where we can demonstrate this pretty well with, uh, if we look at liability. So for the first time, a liability regime will be in place. Liability being, okay, you have to pay money if you do something wrong, simply. In this proposal in Article 9, uh, this is regulated. So you will be liable for any direct damage due to the failure to comply with the state-of-the-art uh, requirement of security in Article 15, unless you, has no, you have not acted negligently. So this will mean that certificate authorities will be liable for all damage uh, that will uh, occur uh, associated with their operations on the internet. Other, web other stakeholders go unmentioned. So websites that buy cheap, too cheap certificates or poorly implement HTTPS, unmentioned. Untimely patching by browsers or OS manufacturers, not mentioned. Software liability perhaps, not mentioned. <coughs> This will have real, real consequences. I mean, liability may be helpful to incentivize CAs. The security practices at DigiNota were really bad. There was proper logging. Uh, there was really bad logging. And it might help, you know, liability to get yourself up to par if you know you have to pay, right, as a company. So security practices might get better and you might have proper logging because you bear the burden of proof. Um, as, a, as a certificate authority. But, and this is the fundamental point, in Article 9 it says any direct damage. This will mean that DigiNotar, a company from Beverwijk, the glorious Dutch city of Beverwijk, uh, with a yearly turnover of about 5 million euros, will be liable for all damage that occurred after its hack. We have seen CIA, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Skype certificates, everything. So a company of a, with a yearly turnover of 5 million will be liable for all the damage. And this will be very favorable for the incumbents, the big CAs. Think about it. I mean, VeriSign, Komodo, Symantec, or yeah, these are of course li uh, uh, affiliated, but the big companies are able to insure themselves against those sort of really, well, hazardous uh, 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 things. But I, as a, um, uh, you know, if I want to start a certificate authority tomorrow and this regulation is in place, I will think twice. So this uh, is very favorable to the incumbents, but you can also ask yourself the question, is even a big company like Verisign able to bear all liability for uh, something that has gone wrong uh, with, uh, with its certificate authority? I mean, how can one company be liable for the entire internet? There's many more flaws uh, with the e-signatures e regulation, but I don't have time for that today. But I want to uh, finally to, to uh, sort of discuss and, and have the Q&A with you about how you should regulate HTTPS if you regulate it. And I have to warn, it's, we won't, I, I won't talk a lot about the best tech, tech alternative to HTTPS. I'm sorry, I know that that's uh, something that you're probably very interested in, but there's other talks uh, at this conference and other fora that will be much more appropriate for that. Um, especially the Harry Halpin talk of yesterday, um, who discussed a lot about IETF. And that's where you come in, by the way. I'll come back to that later. 
And why is it not good for the law to talk about the best technical solution? Well, we all know that regulatory cycles are very slow um, and that law should not force technology development. But what law can do is help to incentivize economic and political actors. And that's what I want to talk about a bit with you today. When I was in the EU Parliament, that's of course the first thing, I had a meeting with, uh, with uh, the responsible, uh, or one of the responsible parliamentarians. And the first question I, is, uh, I had is, you know, um, do you know what HTTPS is? And I got a sort of a <laughs> glaring uh, gaze back at me. Um, so there's a pretty long way to go, I have to say. Um, um, there was probably no uh, there was uh, surely no understanding. The people didn't know what HTTPS was in the first place. So we have a long way to go. Anyway, in our paper, and that's uh, uh, it, it's it's one of the first legal analysis of HTTPS authentication. We adopt value chain uh, a value chain uh, model. So we look at all the stakeholders involved and at all their interactions and how they impact security. Um, what I'm very generally going to say about this is that we find in our paper that a global socio-technical system is very hard to regulate. I mean, law is always local, and this system is global. And on the other hand, I mean, it's, it's really a, uh, a technical problem that uh, technology should uh, address. So what is needed is robust technical and policy solutions. And Moxie Marlenspike, who is a hero in this field, uh, his IETF proposal on, um, on tag pinning is currently running. Google has an interesting proposal as well. And there's a lot of Firefox add-ons that, that could provide more security. Uh, what is interesting about the Google proposal is, of course, that Google has both uh, a browser and important web services. So it has really the leverage to enforce a new system upon sort of the rest of the internet. Um, a CA pinning, very shortly, it's about that websites can decide, okay, this is my certificate, and I won't accept any uh, other certificates offered in this uh, interrelation. So you sort of take away the systemic vulnerability that any certificate authority can just, you know, go out and um, launch uh, or issue certificates for any domain name. But even if these sort of technical proposals are adopted, critical vulnerabilities remain. So a purport, uh, sort of perpetual effort is, is very vital. Now, what can the law do? The law is, is a very good instrument to sort of uh, look at uh, the incentives that are in such an ecosystem and, um, and help to incentivize uh, actors that are involved. So what the law should do is it should make the full set of underlying values explicit. Now, in the current EU proposal, it's only about e-commerce. It's only about money. It's only about the digital economy. That's very problematic because HTTPS is very vital for e-commerce, but it's also very vital, vital um, um, very important for uh, reliable communications and for privacy, communications freedom, and other values. So the EU proposal should sort of make a broader set of underlying values and should sort of provide a framework of how to balance them. That is what politicians do, right? So, um, yeah. So um, it should uh, apprise constitutional values such as privacy and communications freedom. And very importantly, as we saw with Digi Notar, such a legal instrument should uh, provide a solid legal basis for the ex uh, exercise of executive power. I mean, a Dutch government, you know, calling up a certificate authority and saying, we'll be there in one hour, and then you will be mine. <laughs> I mean, that's not the way it, it should work in democracies. And then, in order to sort of, um, um, in order to sort of uh, um, uh, come to a sort of uh, a sensible way of analyzing what the incentives are in such an ecosystem, um, it is very important to adopt a value chain approach. So that actually tells you that you should identify all the stakeholders that are involved and their interactions. Um, and analyze if the incentives lead to desired outcomes, the current incentives. So how does the market function and what does it lead to? And there's a very interesting new field 
uh, championed by uh, uh, Ross Anderson of Cambridge University, but Bruce Schneier writes about it all the time. Um, it's about 10 years old, and it's about security economics. And security economics actually tells you that most security problems are not of a technical nature, but it's all about money, actually. So are stakeholders sort of interested in in adopting new, uh, uh, new models for authentication, for example? Or are they more interested in keeping the, the stuff as they were because they will earn more money, basically? Okay, um, a glimpse of future work. Uh, bear with me, this is still a uh, work in progress, so uh, we will enhance the paper with empirical data. We are currently working on enhancing the paper with uh, the SSL Observatory and the ICSI, uh, the, the Berkeley Trust Tree uh, data that I already uh, showed you. And this is all part of my uh, larger PhD project on the governance of communication security. And that looks in more or less uh, what is and how regulators should uh, approach um, communication security. I also will look at what the structural legal vulnerabilities are to communication security and what regulation is good for. And that's more sort of the fundamental question that all sort of tech lawyers are, uh, tech law researchers are struggling with today. So what, what can regulation be good for in a global social technical ecosystem? And I will perform some new case studies similar to HTTPS, so we hope, I hope I'll be here next year presenting about another big hack that was somewhere in the world, and uh, we can talk about that later. Um, finally, my main message is for this HTTPS thing is that it is completely broken, and somebody needs to fix it, and that someone is not the legislator, but it is you. Uh, it is technical people that have understanding, deep, deep understanding of the complexities at hand and um, that work together in these loose uh, um, uh, fora such as the IETF into augmenting this. And when you regulate HTTPS, you should be very humble on technology. The current proposal is not uh, and it will probably do more harm than good if it stays in its current form. So if the EU wants to do uh, uh, good stuff in this um, environment, it should apprise all the underlying values, so not only the economy, but also digital rights and communication security. It should think about all the stakeholders involved, not only certificate authorities, even though DigiNotar was uh, doing so poorly. And um, it should think about optimizing economic and bureaucratic incentives rather than technology. Thank you very much. Okay, Axel, thank you. There is a maximum 10 minutes time left for question and answers. If you have any questions, go to a microphone and uh, speak Sorry. to them. The gentleman over there. First, I have some comment why bad country Iran did all this thing. Um, this is the infrastructure problem because Americans had uh, the possibility to go uh, for CAs and say, give us the certificates, we need to listen to the traffic, because Iran had no such possibility, so that was the only way to do. But I uh, wanted to, to have a little comment about identity. Uh, first thing is the corporate identity. I haven't seen it in the constitution of every country that any corporation has been defined there. And it's a big problem in, in our world because Facebook is not written into the constitution as a person. And you see the cons uh, consequences. And now my question is, who from you has the chip under, under the skin? Me, me have. Ah. Yeah, I am O.S. Estland and uh, I have this kind of chip and I will not talk long, uh, it's a usual ID card but the chip is really working and uh, when going for government infrastructure or for banking then believe or not some material for this chip is included into the no, handshake. SSL handshake. So uh, things are possible. Uh, now the question is why you think VeriSign is still in the business? Why, why uh, nation and state governments so, are... So the, so are the question is, why is VeriSign still in the business? Yes, okay. because uh, why at all commercial companies should provide CA services? I don't understand this. This should be nation states or what do you think? Thank you. Take a couple of questions. Okay. Um, 
I really would like to have a chat with you on your implanted chip afterwards. That's pretty damn interesting. But um, why VeriSign is still in business? Well, that is a cultural thing. I mean, in the United States, corporations are much more trusted than the government, I guess. Um, in other, in other um, sort of uh, countries, I'm, I'm partly uh, from Scandinavia, I'm half Danish. In Denmark, the trust in the government is extremely large. So that is a cultural thing. Why um, businesses are still sort of interested in doing this? Well, they earn a lot of money, of course. And um, uh, it is also traditional something that is, uh, came sort of bottom up. So this is something, the CA thing and the man in the middle attack thing in the 1990s was not at all something that was part of the threat model at the time. I mean, cyber criminality and stuff like that. So this all came about because there was some problem. We needed identification and we needed sort of a, a secure channel. And, um, uh, and that's why this all came about. And it still hasn't gone because, well, because of cultural and economic factors, I would say. Yeah. Next question is for the Sigma Angel. So there are, there are a few questions from IRC. Uh, the first one is, uh, do you really believe there will be any change when the EU takes over, but the other CAs are all scattered all over the world? I mean, the, the bad guys are just going to go somewhere else. <coughs> well, that is, of course, um, a, a very uh, good question and a, and, a, and a big, you know, it's a big complexity of regulating the internet anyway. Um, we have, of course, I mean, th that's why intuitively one would think that it's much more, uh, a much more successful strategy for the regulator would not be to focus on certificate authorities, but actually on websites. I mean, if you sell products or offer services in the EU, there's a lot of regulation you should comply with. And it's, it makes more sense to look in that direction of solving this problem, and maybe for liability schemes and, and, and what have you, than looking at CAs, which indeed, as you say, are you know, governments all around the world, companies all around the world, and how are you going to find your, uh, how are you going to enforce action against your certificate authority on uh, a given island in the Philippines, right? I mean, that's pretty, uh, pretty complex. So, um, uh, yeah, it, look, it, it would be, make more sense to look in other places of the value chain. Okay, next question is for the gentleman with the microphone, number one. Okay. Um, don't, by don't the way, think keep it short, by the way. You're running out of time. Yep. D don't you think it's more important not to focus on the CAs, but getting the key and trust chain correct, like putting it onto DNS or some place else? Yeah, very good question. Um, um, as I tried to explain, but maybe I wasn't clear enough, um, the real problem here is a technical problem. And um, HTTPS authentication is broken in many ways. And indeed, as you, as you say in your question, um, the, the first sort of effort that really should, is, is needed right now is uh, in, indeed something like CA pinning or Moxie Marlin Spike's proposal getting through and getting implemented. And at the implementation level is of course where the regulator can, can be successful, but not at determining what should be, um, uh, what should be implemented. But indeed, yes. Okay, final question, microphone number one. Okay, um, my point is, uh, if you look at the system it's, uh, uh, of CAs, it's a point where you give the decision who you trust to someone else. And the problem is, uh, how can you trust them? You do, do not decide for yourself. If we uh, define a system where we define it ourselves, we have to uh, make a contact, a first contact in any form, and this first contact, if it is not in person or in any direct way, mm -hmm. we cannot secure the first contact. This is the problem. Uh, even though there's the PGP model with the ring of trust, where web of trust, where other people uh, I trust, trust someone else, but uh, that web extends so much and someone says, oh, I sign your key, you sign my key, but uh, don't verify it really, and so it's not working. Uh, so 
we have a general problem with trust in uh, if we do not directly exchange the keys ourselves. Yeah, you're, um, you're probably very right. Um, but we also have a problem of connectivity if you would try to adopt a ring of trust model in a global sort of functioning e-commerce market. I mean, uh, uh, when I go out searching for products on the, on the internet, I usually look at where it is cheapest and I buy it. And then, you know, I get in this HTTPS environment of a given company anywhere in the EU or maybe not in the EU. And as a consumer wanting to, I mean, that is of course a very big problem. So what actually should play a larger role is looking at different types of communication and sort of making a risk assessment on a personal level, but maybe also on a more societal and larger level, sort of what level of security do you want? And currently in HTTPS, it's a, it's a pretty binary thing. It's either not HTTPS or it is HTTPS. And when you have HTTPS, it's often very poorly in implemented. So um, yeah, this, the, on many levels, this is a problem that really needs fixing. And um, well, if there would be some smart super smart magician out here that could uh, uh, make a very usable ring of trust model on HTTPS, you would probably get a Nobel Prize or anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, time is up, basically.